Hello class, welcome. This week, today, we are gonna talk about language. Now, you may be thinking language, this is gonna be a boring lecture. It's actually not, it's gonna be really exciting. Language is arguably the most essential component of our human communication. Language is basic to our view of the world. It constructs how we see the world and it helps us construct our reality. Now, this week we're gonna explore the relationship between words and how we communicate our ideas. We're gonna look at some important characteristics of language and how these characteristics affect our interpersonal communication. Stay tuned. Okay, so very quickly, let's define what language is. Language is subjective, language is symbolic. Um, words that we use, they gain their meaning through symbols. They don't have any meaning just by themselves. So certain rules in society dictate the way that our language is constructed. And these rules determine how sounds make words, arrangement of symbols, and how meaning and interpretation are formed. People create meaning for words because symbols represent different things for different people. The A word is not gonna mean the same thing to myself as, as it has meaning to you, or especially somebody from another culture. Something that I have always found interested about language is that words influence the way that we view others and view ourselves. And with words, we construct titles. And this is especially true in the workplace. Someone who was, you know, um, an employee one week, the next week becomes a supervisor. And you will all of a sudden see that um, the words and the way that you talk to the person will change and possibly the way that they speak to subordinates will change as well. Same person, they haven't changed, but the words that they use and the title that they have, have changed. For example, maybe when they were an employee, you know, let's say at Chick-fil-A, they would say, you know, gosh, we should clean this floor. It is really filthy. We should clean the floor. Versus someone that who is now a supervisor says, you will clean this floor right now, right? Totally different tone, totally different set of words, um, a little bit of shift in their words and their tone and the way they use those words. And, you know, if you're a good supervisor, you'll learn to adopt your words to your title in a way that is the most effective in the workplace. For example, um, you're welcome to clean this floor if you get time today. Something like that, a little bit more suggestive and, suggestive and less forceful. So um, communicators, again, adopt their speech in a variety of ways, again, to build relationships with others and get their communication goals met. Communicators also adopt their speech so that it's either more similar or different to others. You know, someone, you know, gets a, a promotion. Let's stick, stick it to the workplace since we're already there. Someone who gets a promotion, they automatically change their speech. Like, you know, they start using different words and they start using more condescending words. It's like, oh, dude, you just got promoted. You know, you, you know, you want to use similar speech so that you can um, be more effective in your communication. And, and language, what's interesting to sum, or, to sum it all up is that language patterns um, communicate more or less power, right? So that's really important to keep in mind in the workplace because language communicates power. So language is so powerful because it's a form of expression. It is how we create meaning and construct our social reality. So think about the language that you have heard in childhood. Um, there was a study done by a school teacher in 1968. Her name was Jane Elliott. And what she did was she told, based on eye color, she told one group of students that they were smarter than the other. Simply based on her words and her language, those who were deemed superior or smarter all of a sudden became arrogant, they were bossy, they were really unpleasant to their classmates. <clears throat> Another really interesting impact was that their grades on simple tests had improved just because of the words that she had spoke. So they all of a sudden got smarter, um, they just really transform. Um, the students who were told that they were inferior, their grades, you know, were poor. Um, during recess, they isolated themselves. They completely changed how they saw themselves and how they acted. Um, 
and even if they what was interesting even if they were smart before it's simply be because these kids were told that they were more um academically inferior they performed inferior so that was interesting our words uh certainly have consequences and certainly do create our reality um another thing that you want to look at when you're using words are um emotive languages emotive language so you'll see in the news the two news stations will be talking about the same story and for one for example um it, with the riots they will call you know you can say a mob versus a group of people if they're rioting they'll use completely different language one positive one negative i i'm not uh, uh, uh cheering for either but they, they use different language talking about the same thing and the same people so you will see that the media can shape your viewpoint based on the words that they use they can shape your viewpoint on a story and that is power um, also language can evoke emotions um, another thing that you want to consider is in your language choice if you say oh you know um I, I i was talking to your son today he's very inquisitive you can say i was talking to your son today he he's very curious or you can say girl your son is so nosy you know so you're you're basically talking about the same thing but each word denotes, um, you know, a positive or a negative connotation wherever you stand. So remember that your language can be provocative. It is very powerful and it definitely constructs our reality. How we speak and the words that we use vary depending on a variety of factors. And this includes our environment, our regional location, and our cultural background. Now I want you guys to think about the words that you use. Does it vary depending on your social situation? Of course it does. You're not going to use the same language that you would use hanging out on a Saturday night with friends that you would use, for example, in church. Now, some of the types of language are standard vocabulary. So that those are the words that we use in our everyday life. Those are the words that most people accept and know. They're universally known. Uh, when you're at work and you're in class, you, you, you let's say you go to a group study, there is an acceptable group of words that you're going to be used. If someone starts talking, you know, arbitrarily, you're going to be like, this guy is weird. Don't invite him back to study group. Right. So these words that are universally accepted, typically accepted, are known as standard vocabulary. They're words that are universally understood. You might also have words in your vocabulary that you might use in class but not use at work and these words would be um, words that are related to uh, your profession your workplace and a type of expertise and there also might be words that you use informally with your friends and these words would be considered non standa now we also have code and code refers to a type of non standard language this could include slang or jargon you know, you know, words that you'll be out with your friends and you can look at them and, you know, you guys have a, a code language, a secret language that means, you know, I'm not interested in this person. Come save me from the conversation. That would be code or jargon that you would use. Um, and they're arranged by their arbitrary. They have arbitrary meaning and they're arranged by your personal rules of syntax and the way that you use to communicate them. Now, for example, a slang word um, that has been used for a number, number of years is the word cool. Slang is a way of expressing an idea, an image, or a symbol um, in a unique verbal manner. For example, um, cool refers to something good or positive, et cetera, et cetera. You guys get it. Words um, that are used for specific regions are considered colloquialism. So, for example, uh, in the Midwest, soft drinks are referred to as pop and on the east coast in the united states um in the on the east coast of the united states and on the west coast where we are soft drinks are referred to as soda so those are just some examples of different types of language based on character location and cultural background if we use abstract language, it can hinder our ability to meet our communication goals because it can leave far too much room for interpretation. So take a look at these examples of abstract versus concrete language. And we wanna be able to achieve the most effective communication. So we wanna be using as much concrete verbiage as possible. 
and this is especially true in the workplace. Let's say that you are presenting and you are doing a, a business proposal on a business presentation on um, projections and how your how the business has done in the previous three months. So if you say that we suffered a significant loss, um, no big deal. You know the room's not gonna. You know nobody's gonna think anybody anything of it because it's not very powerful language. But if you say you we suffered, if you if you are more concrete and you say we suffered an eighty seven percent loss, then people might start. Um, freaking out, uh, reviewing their resumes and looking for another more stable place to work, right? So we definitely want to use concrete verbiage in effective communication, especially in the workplace and especially when you have important communication goals that need to be met. Let's take a look at some troublesome language, starting with vague words. Vague words is when someone uses words like always, never, when people use extreme words like this, immediately an alarm bells go off because no one always does something and quite rarely does someone never does something. It's just a type of extreme wording that can signal a red flag in a conversation. So we want to stay away from extreme or vague language. The next is slang. Slang words may be appropriate in one situation, but they are not appropriate for all situations. And I noticed that a lot of people will try to bring slang into the workplace or professional environments, and it just doesn't fly. It makes it often makes uh, coworkers uncomfortable. So we want to sh be sure that we're using the appropriate language for every situation, especially in the workplace. We want to stay away from wordy language. Listen, um, have you been talking to somebody and been thinking, I wish they would just get to the point already. I mean, I know I talk a lot, but that's because I'm lecturing. So <laughs> I usually am straight to the point because I understand that your attention span, our attention span as humans is not what it once was. So get to the point. Do not beat around the bush. Get to the point when you're talking because people will just stop listening to you. Avoid using language that is too wordy. Next, we have cliches. Now, cliches are another thing that really, along with talking too much, cliches are something that makes people go on autopilot and really stop listening to you. It reduces the effectiveness of your language. So we want to, in looking at these troublesome um, ways of speaking and word choices, we want to choose our words more carefully and tactfully, and this will make sure that we make the right selections and adopt our language to the appropriate situation. And speaking of poor word choices, let's talk about powerless language. I want you guys to go out into the world and I want your words to have power behind them. So let's look at how we can avoid language that has no power behind it. And this includes hedges. Hedges include words like kind of, sort of, or responses that don't convey much confidence. Tag questions include phrases like, mm, I, don't you think? Um, am I right? You end your sentences with words like that. It's like tag. What do you think? Because I'm not really sure basically is what you're saying. And again, this indicates lack of confidence. Qualifiers. Um, now, those are those are words that could include maybe or uh, could be. They're just very arbitrary. They're not very specific. Right. So when you're expressing expertise, for example, um, if you're a doctor and you're speaking to a patient and they're like, what's wrong with me? And you're like, it could be um, just a random headache or it could be cancer. I, you know, I don't know. You know, it's like, no, tell me, <laughs> I need you to be specific, doctor. So especially in the workplace, especially in um, professions of expertise, you really <laughs> want to use specific concrete words that have power behind it and avoid using powerless language. So guys, as we wrap up, I wanna to talk to you about grammar. If you want to be respected and taken seriously in life and especially in the workplace, use proper and appropriate grammar. If you speak in a way that is inappropriate, it's gonna affect the way that you are perceived. Let's be real. It is not always the person that is the smartest that gets promoted. It is the person that is perceived to be the most competent that gets the promotion. And the way that you speak and the words that you use affect the way that people perceive you. It is just a fact of life. Have you ever seen someone get a job promotion and you're like, hey, why didn't I get that promotion? And you wonder, because the supervisor perceives them to be 
the most competent and qualified for the job. And, you know, language and the words that we use and our grammar affect how people perceive us. You are engaging in impression management when you speak, for better or for worse. So make sure that when you speak, you understand the rules of grammar and you follow them, especially in the workplace. Okay, so just to wrap things up, when you're speaking, be sure to use gender neutral language as much as possible. Consider the cultural implications of what you're saying. You cannot really say anything in the workplace. Um, you, you will get in trouble. Your words can easily get you in trouble now in the workplace. So be careful what you say at work, okay? I cannot emphasize that enough. And then also, and also on social media, just be careful about the words that you speak. You can, it, they can get you in a lot of trouble. Also, if you're a person that curses, you know, avoid profanity, especially in the workplace. It makes others uncomfortable. It offends their sense of morality. So, you know, just be appropriate um, and, and avoid profanity. When you speak, you, especially in the workplace, you are developing credibility. Whether you know it or not, you're engaging in impression management. So use your language wisely and use it responsibly. In the workplace, we wanna formalize our language as much as possible. Language is one of the most important tools in your communication tool belt. There are a variety of tools at your disposal when using your words. So make sure to choose those that are most effective so that you can get your communication goals met. Here are some references for you to review. So that's our lecture for this week. This has been a lecture on interpersonal communication, language, and how it affects our interpersonal communication. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, or outbursts, reach out. I'm always available and I'm here to serve. I'm Professor Heron. I will see you next time.